Chapter 29, The Search for Order in an Era of Limits, 1973 to 1980. So we're talking about the 1970s here, the One Nation Under Change. So the 70s was a decade that was like the 1960s hangover. So much had happened in the 60s, and then it was just kind of over. The Vietnam War was, was ended. The civil rights movement regarding any group quieted way down. Uh, crazy politics and revolutionaries had nothing to revolt about anymore. So the 70s was like an opposite of the 60s. Uh, peace and love was replaced with the me decade, more of a self-serving era where you took care of your own. You took care of your own interests, not so worried about everybody else like you had been in the 60s. Uh, politics would never be the same. All the distrust of the government, you know, the, the baby boomers stopped trusting the people in charge, led to eras uh, since that demand more transparency from their governments. So you want to be able to look in and see. So if you think about a, to, to put a definition on transparency, and I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself, but this is the analogy that, that I use for people that don't understand what I mean by, by transparency. If you look at a building uh, that's got no windows in it, that and it's it's the government. They're inside there and they're doing what they're doing, but we don't really know what they're doing because we can't see inside. But you put windows on the government building, and now it's now that now it's transparent. You can look inside and watch them rip us off, right? That's what I mean by transparency. The 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 people want to know what the government and the politicians are doing. Prior to that, you didn't question it too much. You trusted them, but that changed because of the 60s. Uh, the, feelings, the feelings changed from the greatest generations believing in the honor of the government that would support anything they suggested, like supporting the Vietnam War, to the baby boomers, their children questioning authority and turning away from everything. But in the 70s, the economy faltered greatly. Uh, there was no longer a war to fuel the economy. So not like World War II, where we talked about how the American economy was booming in production of war goods, but it continued afterward because of the Marshall Plan and rebuilding Europe and America hadn't been destroyed like the European countries. But now this is this this war goes back to the to the normal way. The economy drops off because the war's over. Uh, so the general feeling in the 1970s was depression and a general negativity. So I've got to take a little bit of an issue with that. I, I went to high school in the 19, early 1970s. I graduated high school in 74. You know, I came of age in the 70s, and it was a whole lot of fun for me. So, um, you know, I, I was young, perhaps not aware of all that was going on. But, but I, I've got to give a little bit of a plug for the 70s. I, I certainly had a lot of fun. So what's the big event of the 70s? Probably the, water, the Watergate scandal with Richard Nixon. It started with the break-in uh, of the Democratic headquarters at the Watergate Hotel. So if you ever asked a question, I don't know, by a friend or maybe on an exam, what does Watergate mean? It means it, it's the name of a hotel in, in uh, Washington, D.C. It became known as the Watergate uh, incident because it happened there. So the Watergate Hotel is huge, and they and they – rent out office space. The Democratic headquarters for the 1972 election was, was, uh, was, was there, had, had, a, had their headquarters there. Uh, and there's a break-in. This would prove to be the rotten cherry on top of the Nixon's administration that would ultimately drive him to resign. So we talked a little bit about it, some of his missteps, uh, uh, sabotaging the Paris peace talks so he could become the hero that would that would end the war bombing Cambodia without anybody knowing uh, this is this is this is his history and this is how it is and we're going to have a supplemental lecture here in a few minutes about him and get into more depth about his entire history uh, so so the Watergate story is really one how president unravels you know finally in in full view of the general public. So the Democratic National Committee, it was where the break-in was at. Five men were arrested for breaking breaking into this bill into this office building. So it was initially written off as an amateuristic burglary, but then it turned out that two of the men were former CIA and FBI. So from the start it looked very suspicious. Nineteen seventy two was an election year. Uh so because the CIA and FBI was involved, 
the president was asked if he knew of this event, and he said, I have no knowledge of it at all. I have no idea what's going on, the break-in. This would prove, or, I'm sorry, this would later prove to be, have been a blatant lie, the first of many blatant lies. Uh, but Nixon in 1972, running for a second term, was actually very popular for de-escalating the Vietnam War. It wasn't over in '72, but it was it was heading that way. So he got a lot a, a lot more popularity than he had in his in his first election, where I mentioned before he only won by one percent of the vote. He was running against a man named George McGovern. Uh, George McGovern, a liberal senator from South Dakota, anti-war platform, the return of POWs. There was a lot of controversy about POWs that that weren't being sent home, and, and he pushed for that. He called for amnesty for draft evaders, the, the, the men that went to Canada and the guys that burnt their cars. He calls for amnesty. Uh, so, so perhaps that it was a little, little too early in 1972 or for people to accept this. This uh, immediately lost him the conservative vote, the greatest generation vote. They were not ready to forgive draft dodgers who went to Canada thought they were cowards. <clears throat> also, <clears throat> he also campaigned in a huge reduction of the military, uh, which, of course, also was not popular with the greatest generation. But the interesting story about all this is, is why this event happened at all. It, it, it was kind of an unnecessary thing, this, this Watergate incident for Nixon's campaign. So to better understand why it happened, we need to look at Richard Nixon a little closer. So let's do our supplemental lecture here uh, on Richard Nixon, okay? <clears throat> okay, uh, introduction. Known for his part in Watergate. And the question is why? He didn't really need to, to do that. He was going to win that election hand in 72 hands down. But he had a long history of questionable behavior. And here's the history. Uh, McCarthy, Checkers, the, the, the debate in 1960. A corrupt election in China. So I didn't put Paris and Cambodia in there because we've already talked about that. I don't want to make it too long. But but don't forget if it's if it's on the outline, then write about it if this is a choice that you that you take. Many people will say, you know, jump to uh uh checkers and China and Watergate and I'm out. You, you've got to tell me a little bit about each thing if it's on the outline, okay? I'm not asking you to write a book about them. Neither, neither one of these uh, requires that, okay? Okay, um, Watergate, number three, the break-in, and who, were, who are Woodward and Burns, and what, what part did they play in the story? And then finally, the relevance. The Watergate scandal changed politics forever, ending the do-not-question-authority point of view. Now, we've been talking about how this is being dismantled for a long time, but this would end it for nearly everybody. Today, as a result, Americans question their leadership and think more critically about the presidency. Whether you're a liberal or a conservative, you know, we, we just don't give them breaks anymore like we used to, okay? Okay, let's get started. So, so it, there was never much of a threat for Nixon to lose this election in 1972. Uh, many young people were supporting him, turning away from the anti-war and supporting him because he was, he was uh, diminishing the, the troops. Uh, and there was also a, a surge of conservative conservatism in the country. Uh, so ultimately, Nixon would beat McGovern in a landslide victory. And as the story unfolds about Watergate, so understand that the, the break-in happened during that election year, but he hadn't been reelected yet. The break-in happened in the, in the summer, and he was then reelected that following November. And would take his second his second term in '73. So people were aware of it, but he still was elected. As the story it unfolds and, and and the truth comes out, it's hard not to ask the question, like I said before, why? Why would you bother to do all that you did? You didn't need any intelligence about McGovern. He never really had a chance. Nixon could have could have you know uh, had a meager campaign and probably would have won. Uh, so why would he do that? Well, again, I mentioned before he was narcissistic. He just saw himself as as Nixon the Great, Nixon the King, the King Richard the First. Here's here's Barry Goldwater. We talked about him 
in the past a little bit. We'll talk about him more. Uh, Barry Goldwater was the leader of the conservative wing of the Republican Party in the 60s. And this is what he has to say about Nixon. I have characterized Nixon as a loner, a cold man with great self-confidence and a one-track mind centered, centered on the advancement of Richard Nixon. Uh, so Nixon's been a controversial person uh, in politics since the beginning. Always obsessed with his place in history. And he, when he became the president, he wanted to orchestrate it in a certain way to make himself look even greater than perhaps he was. But let's go through some of the incidents that uh, that that were, you know, are, are compelling about his history. Uh, Nixon had been a whoops. Nixon had been a, a huge supporter of Joseph McCarthy. We we talked about him, the witch hunt, and how he ruined people's careers. And there you see Nixon on the right. Uh, you know, we saw the film where the man said, have you no decency, sir? And it ruined him. And, and McCarthy was finally brought down. Years of, of hearings trying to root out communists never found one. Nixon was a huge supporter of, of Joseph McCarthy and the idea of McCarthyism. So that 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 wasn't such a, a bad thing then. I think I think today we look back on McCarthyism as not so good. Uh so Nixon was was obsessed with the quest to identify communists and root them out of the government, entertainment industry, and the military. Uh, Nixon uh, became vice president, running out with Dwight Eisenhower in 1952. Uh, but during the campaign, so understand, it's, it's Eisenhower's campaign. He's running for president. Nixon's his running mate. But during the campaign, Nixon was accused of of improprieties regarding campaign funds. $18,000 had disappeared and no one was quite sure what happened to it and it looked like he had pocketed it, okay? Uh, so Eisenhower gets very angry at him and says, you know what, you better fix this or you're off this ticket. Uh, Nixon, of course, is beside himself because he's dying to be a, um, a uh, politician. So he, he made a special t a speech to America on TV, claiming innocence in the affair. He was not keeping any of the funds for himself. This speech famously became known uh, as the Checkers speech. So again, if you write about this, don't just tell me it's the Checkers speech. Tell me why it's called the Checkers speech. It's about the man's dog. Okay, I understand that. It's called that because the dog plays a part in the story. Okay, so we'll get to that here in a minute. Uh, so go ahead and watch a couple of films here back to back. It's actually kind of part one and part two of the same speech. But please watch the film uh, Richard, Nixon, Richard Nixon Checkers number one and then watch Richard Nixon Checkers number two. Uh, go ahead and watch those films and then come, come on back. Okay, so he didn't take any campaign funds, and, and he's trying real hard to, to make everyone believe that. So I ask you, did you believe him? Did, did you feel he was honest? Did you feel he was bit being forthcoming? Was he someone that you would trust, or did you not trust him? And, and I would say many people today, because we are on this side of Watergate, and, and this is what I mean, Watergate changed politics forever. Uh, this happened on the other side of Watergate, and people forgave. People people trusted much much more. So, um, Greatest Generation believed it. Uh, baby Boomers later would not. So, but but it worked for him back then. Uh, he he ended up. Most people gave him a break, and they were they were elected, and of course they they served two terms. But going back to the dog, please tell me that this it, the reason why it's called the checkers speech is because of his dog. I didn't keep the money, but but I am going to keep that dog. That dog, my little girl loves that dog, and we're going to keep that dog. It's it's just so <clears throat> it's a little cheesy. Okay, okay, and people look back on it today as a cheesy attempt at gaining sympathy for a very serious charge. So, so Nixon is uh, Eisenhower's vice president for eight years. Then in 1960, he runs for president himself, okay, and he runs against John Kennedy. And they have some very famous debates in 1960. So understand, again, television is just emerging. Not everybody had one, and, and not everybody was used to seeing uh, candidates like this. And, and uh 
during this debate, uh, it, it seemed that Kennedy understood the power of TV. He looked young and vibrant, even regal. Nixon was sweating. He hadn't shaved that day out of what they call the five o'clock shadow. He was wiping his nose. He was dripping. So he came off as a little a little untrustworthy and perhaps a little sleazy. Uh, so Kennedy won a very close election, and many historians believe that this debate, this very famous debate, was the incident that pushed people to Kennedy. Uh, it's interesting. There's some evidence, and I would say it has nearly been accepted as fact today, that there was fraud in the 1960s election. Uh, Kennedy's, oops, sorry, Kennedy's father, Joseph Kennedy, was a very wealthy and influential man. Uh, Joseph Kennedy was obsessed with his son becoming the president, and it wasn't John Kennedy, it was Joe Jr. Uh, he was, you know, uh, setting him up to become, grooming him to become the president. But Joe Jr. was killed in World War II, so the next, son, the next oldest son was John, so John became the obsession of his father. Very wealthy, very influential. It's believed that Joseph Kennedy's people fixed the vote in Texas and Illinois, giving John Kennedy those those days 51 electoral votes and a majority in the Electoral College. Uh, of course, if, if you were running for president and you lost a very close battle, then you learned that your opponent perhaps had been corrupt and stole the, the election from you by getting you know, uh, improper votes, electoral votes, what would you do? That would irritate you, right? I mean, you've come this far, you almost won. Now you find out that maybe the, maybe the person that you're running against cheated you, you would push for an investigation. So when Kennedy found this out, uh, he said, no, I'm not going to question the results because that would harm the country. So he did not mount a challenge. Very interesting. So many conservatives and Nixon apologists today point at that decision as Nixon's true character instead of Watergate. But on the other side of that, there was also belief that perhaps there was more to be found out from uh, corruption on his end, and he was afraid of a, that an investigation would uncover, uh, you know, those kind of things about him. So I, I don't think it's ever in the History of of elections, someone walked away so easily from a from a, a a possible fraud election. So he is not elected. Kennedy's elected in 1960. We talked about him. Then Johnson comes in. Johnson refuses to run in the second term. So uh, Nixon runs, and this time, uh, I'm sorry. So there's our our going back to was Nixon robbed of the presidency in 1960? Never never mounted a challenge about it. Uh, so 19, uh, 1968, Nixon is elected under his Peace with Honor slogan, end the war campaign. Of course, we know that he sabotaged the Paris peace talks, and right after he came in on a, under a Peace with Honor uh, credo, he then starts to secretly bomb Cambodia. So these, he's a subject of of huge contention. He, he's always doing something, it seems, in his history. Uh, and it was, uh, you know, people pushing to end the military operation in Vietnam while he's, and he's saying, yes, sir, while he's secretly bombing Cambodia. Uh, and, it, you know, it's, it's felt that because of Nixon's campaign to escalate the war instead of end it as he promised, resulted in 15,000 additional U.S. soldiers dying and 500,000 Vietnamese and Cambodians. So I mentioned the, the number before, which is 22,000 from extending the Paris peace talks. This, this is from escalating the war when he said he wouldn't. But how many people is that? There's a whole lot of men, a whole lot of young American men that died because of his decisions, okay? Uh, so people didn't always trust him, even though he seemed to always land on his feet. He, he did have his moments in his presidency. He opened up trade with China, opened up the relations with communist Red China. We talked about how, uh, how uh, Red China be became communist after the war. Truman didn't want to send troops in there, and, and the entirety of China, a former ally, became uh, communist. So 
the relationship ended between America and China when that happened. Nixon opens it back up. And this is a huge coup for him. This is a feather in his cap. Tremendous victory because trade is opened up with Asia again and, and the start of of a you know better relationship. So again, this is where what Nixon's followers, mostly conservatives, another one, they point to this as what he should be remembered for. Uh, so I'm just going to say it real quickly before I get to Watergate. You know, should we remember people for the good things they do or the bad things they do? Because we all do good and bad things. And I think you have to weigh it, right? You, I mean, you kind of have to weigh each one. So I've given you a whole a whole list of negatives, but he did do the the China opening, which was nice, and it it definitely uh, gave him some momentum in popularity, and it 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 helped the American economy. But just to give you an example, you know Adolf Hitler um, was a pretty decent artist. Uh, in fact, was looking to become a, a painter. You know, for his life before World War One happened, he was also very good with children. He had a way with young children. They liked him. They were drawn to him. Should we remember him for those two things, or for the Holocaust, for the extermination of a race of people, six six million Jews, for you know, um, uh, hating? Uh, anybody that wasn't like him, you know, anybody that was disabled or gay or anything that was not on his radar, he hated and wanted to get rid of. So when you weigh those two things, pretty decent painter, good with kids or the Holocaust, you know, the, the scale kind of slams down against him, right? So that's that's how I feel about Nixon. You know, everyone does does a good thing. All politicians have their moments, even the worst ones. But when you weigh it on the scale, it's going to slam to the negative for, for Nixon. So, so let's talk about Watergate. Uh, so the Watergate Hotel, there it is. As I said before, if you're asked the question, I don't know, on an exam maybe, about what's the what does Watergate mean, it's, it means the hotel, okay? That's where the name of it came from because it happened there. So this is the topper that will end his his – his presidency because he had a big ego. You know, he really thought his presidency would rank right up there with Washington, Lincoln, FDR. So while he was president, he installed a secret recording system in the Oval Office to record every conversation and phone call he made as president. So why would he do that? First of all, it was secret. Nobody knew it was there. So when you walked into the Oval Office to talk to him, the minute somebody spoke, it was voice activated and he started to record you. <clears throat> if somebody picked up the phone, typically it would be him, and talked to whoever, it was recorded. Why would he do that? Because he wanted to record everything that happened so he could later write his memoirs because he, he assumed that everybody would want to buy them, and, and he's, he's the great Nixon. Uh, this would come back to haunt him because this this is how it will be found out that he's lying because they go back and find these tapes and sure enough, he's lying. Uh, so the reason for the break-in was to steal top secret documents and wiretap the phones to, to hear what these people are doing. Uh, and Nixon knew about it from the very beginning. He took steps to cover it up afterwards, raising hush money for the burglars, pay them off, hush money, don't say anything. He tried to stop the FBI from investigating. He destroyed evidence and fired uncooperative staff members. Uh, so even though he goes on national TV with a nice big smile and says, I have no idea. I, I have nothing to do with this. I promise you I'm your president. You can trust me. No, that wasn't true. He was lying. The two Washington reporters uh, did much to break the case and uncover the scandal. This is Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein. And they uh, would write a book about this, and this would win them a Pulitzer Prize. This best-selling book was called All the President's Men, and this became a pretty famous popular movie uh, in, I believe, 1970, uh, probably 74, 5 or 6, somewhere around mid-70s. Uh, much of their information came from an anonymous informer uh so it all comes undone for him for nixon the 
he, there's hearings. Uh, the hearings they're asking for his tapes. He didn't want to give them. Uh, very similar to, to a lot of what Donald Trump's been doing lately about his tax returns and certain things that he says are private on the president. Nixon does the same thing. You can't expect me as the president to abide by your wish. I'm the president. You know, I, I have authority. No, you don't. You're you don't you're not the king. We 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 elected you to be our voice, not to lie to us, okay? So it all comes undone for Nixon and ultimately it it became public knowledge, the tapes come out, damning evidence against him, and Nixon is forced to resign. Uh, his vice president, Gerald Ford, pardoned Nixon for all crimes he committed or may have committed. So it was a long, ugly period. Trust me, I was there. Uh, I, I believe Ford was just trying to put an end to it and let's move on. But this would this would come back to haunt Ford. Uh, Nixon was never prosecuted. He very easily could have been prosecuted in a in a regular court. Uh, you know, again, he wasn't impeached because he removed himself. Impeachment is to remove a person from office. He removed himself. But you could have gone. He, he could have been uh, indicted and taken to you know court, uh, but never was prosecuted because Ford pardoned him. The anger of very, very many because he'd broken the law. And, of course, the young people who, of course, were jubilant, the baby boomers, the anti-war counterculture was jubilant when he resigned, but then crushed when they learned that he had been pardoned, that he had lied to the American public and got away with it. So Nixon gets a nickname of Tricky Dicky, okay? Uh because it, because this is just who who he had been from the very very beginning, going way back to to uh, being associated with McCarthy and Huac and Checkers speech and on and on. It, it this this idea of dishonesty seems to attach itself to him. And again, the big question is why he didn't have to worry about that reelection. But it was just because he had a huge ego and was a control freak, very paranoid about his enemies closing in on him. So he wanted to gain an advantage that he didn't need at all. So tricky dicky. And, of course, the, the result of the Watergate trial put an absolute end forever, apparently, to, to trusting the government. And from this point on, typically, as a people, we don't really trust the government. We will go along with it to an extent until they prove themselves to be corrupt, which we all kind of expect them to be, right? Uh, this happened because of Watergate, okay? So the relevance of the lecture, the Watergate scandal changed American politics forever, ending the do not question authority point of view. Today, as a result, Americans question their leadership and think more critically about the presidency, okay? Okay, that is the end of supplemental election number 14, Richard Nixon. Let's go on here, okay? So, so Gerald Ford becomes, sorry, the next president, 38th president, uh, Nixon's vice president, one of the handful of men that was never elected to the office of president. He was vice president, and Nixon resigns. He became president. Then he was not reelected, so he never was actually elected. Uh, Ford it was committed political suicide by pardoning Nixon. Nobody was ever going to vote for him. In 76, I mentioned before, Carter and Clinton, the, the two Democrats in that long period of, of uh, Republican domination, Carter uh, would beat Ford in 76, as I mentioned before, largely ineffective in his one term. Uh, economy was in bad shape uh, throughout his, his administration. Uh, I mentioned before he was a knee-jerk reaction. Nobody was going to vote for a Republican after Nixon and Watergate. But we're going to look more at Carter in the next chapter. So the 70s was also known as the era of the energy crisis. Shortage of oil. At least that's what OPEC said. So what? who is OPEC? Uh, OPEC is the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, mostly Middle Eastern countries. Uh, they said we're, that we don't have, we're short of oil. Well, it turns out that wasn't true. In retaliation for the U.S. supplying Israel in a war against Arabic nations, the OPEC nations 
uh, stopped sending so much oil to America. So what was the result? Gas prices skyrocketed. It never had happened before. Gas had always been cheap. Gas was, I, I remember gas when it was 29 cents a gallon. I was pretty young, but even into my teenage and early 20s, it, it hadn't reached 60 or 70 cents a gallon. Now, of course, we're well, it's come back down a little now, but I mean, it's still a whole lot more than it used to be. So the result of, of this is gas lines, shortages. We're out of gasoline and it angers people. And they came up with this idea of odd and even days. So if your license plate ended in an odd number, you can only get gas on odd number days and vice versa for even numbers. So, you know, the the American way a, a business is born students that that need time to study they would take a let's say an executive's car to go get gas because it might take you an hour to get gas it sit and study in the car and make money waiting in line for the executive's car to get gas and of course the executive doesn't have to go waste the hour so the American way students uh, students gain some gain access to making some money out of this deal. Uh, in this era, they changed the speed limit to 55 miles an hour. So I, I'm going to challenge you, go on the freeway, do it in the slow lane, because if you get in the fast lane, you're going to be run over. Go in the slow lane and drive 55 miles an hour for a couple of miles. I mean, force yourself to do it for a couple of miles and tell me what you think about it. It's very, very slow. And most people today are doing 75 or more. It seems no, no one seems to be uh, following the speed limit. But in those days, they they uh, changed it to because it was believed that it would save um, gas, okay? it would save oil. Uh, cars began to be energy efficient. Prior to this, it didn't matter how big your car was, V8, eight miles to the gallon. Nobody cared when it was 20 cents a gallon or 30 or 40. Uh, but now better gas mileage became a, a big deal also to conserve oil. So that still, you know, reverberates today. We still look at cars and, you know, how many miles per gallon does it get? Uh, so it's all about energy. And this, this is all coming to a head in this era. Another type of energy that was becoming popular in the 70s, 60s also was nuclear energy. Okay. Let's talk about that and do another supplemental lecture right here. We'll call this no nukes, okay? Okay, uh, here's our outline. <clears throat> Number one, introduction. Environmentalism gained popularity in the 1960s. You have nuclear power, but many people were against it, and that's the, that's the moniker no nukes. So incidents. So if you choose just to write about it, if it's a choice, make sure you tell me about all of these. Don't skip you know, two and write about three. Give me all five. You don't you don't have to write a long, you know, uh, dissertation about each one, but tell me what each one was about. So the incidents are the China Syndrome actually was a movie. Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, Fukushima Daiichi, this happened um, not that long ago, and San Onofre, which of course is the power plant that we had in, in San Diego County here. Uh, positives that came out of the No Nukes movement, the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, and Earth Day. Relevance. Nuclear power had a very dangerous side to it. Was it worth the risk for cleaner, cheaper power? All the controversies regarding nuclear power brought awareness to the issue, and the state of the environment became important to people. Nuclear power is in serious decline today. Okay, let's get started. So environmentalism, this this is the, an idea that was born in the 60s, and the, and the no nukes movement brought it back. Uh, preservation, conservation. Going back to Teddy Roosevelt and the square deal, you know, the, the conservation. But it was also a response to oil spills and overpopulation, and the threat of nuclear war, and, you know, turning our back on the environment. You know, many people would say global warming. Many, many people don't believe that it's happening. Other people do. It's the same type of thing. Uh, people began to be concerned about the state of the planet. Starting in the 60s would, would roll over in the 70s. And I don't know if you had a movement like that so much. You know, the, 
We talked about natives being disgusted how the Europeans tore up the, uh, the land, but but as a movement to to be concerned about the environment. That's the 60s and 70s type of thing. Okay, so this whole idea of the environment was brought into sharper view when there was an accident at Three Mile Island, uh, and I'm going to talk about more about Three Mile Island. I've just I've shown it to you here because that this this is the kind of image that represents the no nukes of the 70s. Uh, so there's an accident at Three Mile Island. Uh, nuclear power had become very popular in the 50s post-war as a way to have a cleaner, efficient method of power. And, and of course, in the 70s, it was popular because it would offset the oil shortage. Yeah. Except for one small problem, a mistake or an accident could be deadly. A nuclear reactor meltdown, if that was to happen, would not be deadly radioactive waste into the atmosphere and potentially kill hundreds of thousands, even millions of people, depending on where that reactor was. So young people, many of them, uh, it, the young people of the 60s, many of them now in their 30s or pushing 40, they stand up again and they rise up against this. But now younger people than them also come up and say, wait a minute, here's here's the government telling us what to do again. And it starts this movement called No Nukes, No Nuclear Power. Sorry, my clicker's not working very well today. So No Nukes became the next big cause, and, and the baby boomers were up in arms and protested. It was like the good old days, okay? Of course, the greatest generation condoned nuclear power as the future. Don't worry about meltdowns. It'll never happen. Never say never. So what is the China Syndrome? Well, it's actually a name of a movie that was released 12 days before the Three Mile Island accident. So so what does the name mean? Well, I mean, symbolically, I mentioned before, if, it was, if, the, if the reactor was to melt down, it would spray radiation into the atmosphere. But it would also burrow down into the ground because it's, it's, it's very hot and it's going to almost dissolve everything in its path. So, so when a reactor, if the cooling system in a reactor shuts down, it's going to get so hot that it's going to explode out the top and melt through the bottom. So the China syndrome, of course, is, is a symbolic idea that it would melt all the way through the earth, all the way to China. So, of course, a bit ridiculous, but that's where the name came from. It, it's it's a serious situation, though. A meltdown is very, very serious. Uh, and you couldn't stop it. Uh, so radioactive material funneling, tunneling its way through the ground and spraying out into the air. But the greatest generation laughed. You foolish young people, there you go again. Uh, nuclear power is wonderful. And it's great. There'll never be a meltdown. Never be a meltdown. Nobody worried, and plans of, for hundreds of plants were in the works. And then, of course, I said never say never. It happened uh, March 28th, 1979, a mere 12 days after this very controversial movie came out. And for 12 days, these huge arguments about It'll never happen, and the young people saying, "But what if it did? It did happen. A minor cooling system malfunction at Three Mile Island caused a partial meltdown, damaged one of its reactors. Now, in this case, the truth is this: this was a minor incident, but it was a big deal because it proved that it could happen. After everyone was saying the government and the greatest generation was saying, saying it couldn't happen, it did happen. It didn't happen on an epic scale, thankfully. But in this case, very little radiation was released into the environment due to the surrounding primary containment vessel. Vessel. No deaths or radiation sickness have been officially attributed to the meltdown at Three Mile Island. But the accident caused public concern. Of course, it couldn't have been better uh, PR for the movie because the movie said it, it was going to happen. Everyone laughed, and then it happened. Uh, so... These new plants, some started to be deauthorized, de and perhaps we should rethink this because, okay, we, we got lucky this time. It didn't, uh, it wasn't a major incident, but 
this this idea of a meltdown is a real real problem okay uh, so nuclear power kind of struggles along for a while after being so popular now people are backing against it and the no nukes movements responsible for that and then finally in chernobyl russia uh, you do find, you do have a major meltdown a major major meltdown April 26, 1986, the worst nuclear disaster in world history, when an explosion in a nuclear power plant unleashed 200 times more radioactivity into the air than the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs combined. One explosion. Uh, 30 people were killed at the uh, by the accident, two immediately that were on the scene working there. 28 others inside of a month from acute radiation poisoning. So it's it's hard to tell how many people have died, you know, since this happened. Uh, what is that? Uh, 34 years ago, is that correct? 34 years have gone by, and it's hard to tell how many people have died because of the accident itself, because cancer is so prevalent in our today's societies, okay? So it's hard to know what, did they die of cancer because of Chernobyl or from something else. But interestingly, there have been 7,000 incidents of thyroid cancer in the Chernobyl area. This is a very unusual and rare type of cancer that you don't see very often. And here there's 7,000 cases of people that were around Chernobyl when, when, it, when the uh, meltdown happened. Yeah, that's a that's that's pretty damning evidence right there. Uh, and here's the bad part: it only released three percent of the radioactive material in the Chernobyl reactor into the atmosphere. The, the remaining ninety-seven percent is still contained today inside that that wreckage right there. This is the problem with nuclear power. We have the same problem in San Onofre. San Onofre has been decommissioned, but but the uh, uh, I'm I'm kind of giving it away here, but the uh, the uh, radio the the radioactive material is still there, uh, and it's only held by a deteriorating concrete shell, Chernobyl in here, uh, that remains inside this damaged reactor. So these are truly one of the world the world's most dangerous ticking time bombs. So now in Chernobyl, they came up with this incredible plan. First of all, nobody lives within miles of this place because there's still radiation in the air because it's it's emanating out all the time. You can't walk up to this building without a hazmat suit on. You would get radiation sickness and probably die in, in a short time. It's still, I'm talking about right now, it's still bad there. 34 years later, it's still oozing radioactive material out of it. They came up with this idea. They, they built these two train tracks kind of wide apart and they built this huge lead cover and they they built it you know far away from the site here so they, so they could not be so close to it but they built it on these railroad tracks that when they were done they rolled it and it actually covered up what you're looking at here uh, this big large i mean imagine the size of this lead shield and they dropped it on the on the uh, wreckage and they sealed it Apparently, okay, that's what they're telling us. Do, do we believe them or not? It's been determined that this will this will stop the radiation from emanating out as quickly, but the lead shield will only be good for about a hundred years. So it's kind of like, okay, we'll just let our grandkids deal with this. <laughs> okay, this is the problem with with nuclear radiation. It takes uh, uh, hundreds of years for it to break down. So we, you know, we have dropped it in plastic containers in the ocean at the bottom of the ocean. There's there's containers of radioactive material just sitting there. We don't know what's going on with them. If it oozes out, if the container breaks, it's going to, you know, be uh, let loose. This is the problem with nuclear power. Okay, the ticking time bombs. Okay, any any other incidents? Well, not that long ago. Uh, oh boy, 2011, powerful earthquake in Japan. Uh, caused a tsunami and huge waves hit the eastern shore of the island. Uh, it was determined that the earthquake was so large that the entire 
main island of Japan actually moved six feet to the east. I don't know if you can properly relate to that. If you're sitting in your house right now like I am, and suddenly my entire world shifts six feet, that, that would be an incredible thing to, to experience. But think of the damage that would be done from that. These, these tsunamis hit the uh, coast and destroy it. And there's, you can go on YouTube and search Japanese tsunami and see some incredible footage of these walls of water just destroying these cities and, and piling up all the debris. Pretty, pretty crazy. Um, but unfortunately, uh, this tsunami also hit the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant there on the coast. You see on the right, uh, the waves hit the power plant. The power generators were quickly flooded, knocked the vital cooling system offline, causing the reactor fuel rods to begin to melt down and leak deadly radiation into the surrounding area. Uh, 16 hours into the disaster, the fuel rods in one reactor had almost completely melted down with the two other close behind. But it would be another 88 days before the Japanese governor, government admitted that a meltdown had occurred. In fact, the American government took a very optimistic stance right as it happened, and they said, yes, the Japanese have it under control. And in fact, they didn't. In fact, the Pacific Ocean was drenched, drenched with radioactive material from this explosion. And at that time, there was a... Well, I mean, at that time, this is not that long ago, some of you probably remember this. Uh, many people were fearful that this wave of radiation is going to hit the United States, the West Coast. And I, I thought, you know, in 2011, I had two young young daughters. And I thought, well, I don't want them to, you know, they're young. I don't want them to, to, be, uh, to be here when that happens. So I thought about taking my two daughters to my sister's place in Utah. Then I saw a map on the on the news that showed me that even if I went to the tip of South America, even if I went all the way into Missouri, you, you're not going to escape this cloud. Now, I'm not trying to overdo it here or or get you freaked out or, or worried. OK, by the time that cloud got to the West Coast, it had dissipated a lot, but not 100 percent. I, I guarantee you that the west coast of the United States, Canada, Mexico, South America got hit with a large cloud of radioactive uh, material because of this explosion. Uh, you know, the, the fish in the Pacific Ocean uh, were drenched with this only nine years ago. Okay, so of course the American government back to to the same old routine don't no worries it's under control we got this you can trust us but that was not the case because this disaster continued for weeks it became the worst nuclear disaster since the 1986 chernobyl incident okay so i mentioned san onofre we got our own power plant here uh when i was a young kid i used to go down from la come in and surf right in front of the power plant it was there's there's good waves there and i remember in the winter, it's cold. The water's cold, and we would we would we would paddle around and find warm spots of water, and you can find them almost almost hot water. And that was because the power plant would would take the water from the ocean and suck it up, and and drench the the uh, the reactor to cool it. And then once, of course, that would boil the water because it's hot. Once that boiling water, you know, once it cooled, it, the boiling water would then be would, would be pushed back out to sea. And we would find these hot spots, and we would laugh at each other about how we used to glow in the dark. So perhaps we were uh, being funny, but it's it is kind of a little scary to think, you know. Um, okay, so San Onofre, uh, built in 1968, but in 2012, not that long ago, it was found that wear on the plant was premature, and it raised eyebrows. Barbara Boxer, who was Barbara Boxer, a California senator. She said it was unsafe and posed a danger to the 8 million people living within 50 miles of the plant. That 8 million people would include us. So if the, if the nuclear power plant at San Onofre was to explode and melt down in an epic, epic way like the 
like Chernobyl, it would have affected millions of people. Most of San Diego County and probably half of LA and all of Orange County, it would have had a huge, it would have been an epic disaster. Uh, and here it is, uh, you know, looking like it's like it's uh, falling apart a little bit. So they decommissioned it in 2013 due to the failure of much of its equipment. So we don't have that fear anymore, except the problem remains at San Onofre. How do we get that nuclear that nuclear waste out of there? Or do we just leave it? Do we just leave it there under, under that, that big concrete reactor? No one has an answer. This is the problem. What do we do with all this waste that's been created from creating all this in, all this energy? Okay. Okay. Some positives of the no nukes movement. The EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, was born from this, forcing developers to do an environmental study of their project and what effect it would have on the environment if they were to be given the green light to build. Okay. Uh, Earth Day. Uh, 20 million people coming together, calling for a safer planet has been going on since that time. And to end the lecture, the relevance, nuclear power had a very dangerous side to it. Was it worth the risk for cleaner, cheaper power? All the controversies regarding nuclear power brought awareness to the issue. And the state of the environment became important to people. So nuclear power is in serious decline today. Okay, that's the end of that. Supplemental lecture number 15, no nukes. Okay, let's wrap this up here. So we remember the Industrial Revolution. It was a big deal. We This, this class spent a lot of time on that. Uh, so what does de-industrialization mean? Like, what? Why would they do that? So after all that buildup of all that time, the 19th century, even back to the 18th century, and a lot of the 20th century, by the, by the end, I'm sorry, the, towards the end of the, 20th century, 70s, it starts, 80s, you start to have what's called deindustrialization. Overseas competition and cheap labor caused many American industries to end and they went overseas. The steel industry, uh, especially after decades of production, came to an end. I can tell you that my family on both sides come from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My grandfathers both worked for U.S. Steel. Steel was what you did living in Pittsburgh until the 1970s. And I, I got to tell you, it was, a, it was an awfully dirty place. You couldn't walk around that town. There was soot everywhere. No matter what you did, it was, it was filthy, belching huge uh, clouds of black smoke coming out of it. Pittsburgh is a beautiful town today, a very pretty town on three rivers because the steel industry is gone. But what happened is everyone lost their job, and it created, uh, you know, decades of, of of poverty and dissent for all the people that live there. Uh, so these plants are sitting empty, and they're just all all across the Northeast. All these industrial cities: Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Cincinnati, New York, Baltimore. You find these these former industries that were booming, mass production. We talked about that. Uh, they're just sitting there empty. So today, these these areas are called the Rust Belt. There you go. Another pictures of these of these factories that were such a big part of the 19th century, just sitting there and rotting away. Uh, deserted plants, people out of work. This this was part of the 70s. Uh, I mentioned before the 70s was depressing on many levels. Okay, back to politics. So. Uh, I talked about the rise of conservative politics. Man is not free unless government is limited. So even after Nixon's missteps, conservative politics continued. Yeah, you had the 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 kind of the hiccup of Jimmy Carter for four years, but it goes back to conservatism when, when Reagan comes in. And as I mentioned before, would continue until Obama, uh, Bill Clinton being an exception, but even he was uh, somewhat of a conservative uh, president made some conservative decisions. Well, what about civil rights? You know, interests waned considerably after the 60s. Now, partly because there were so many gains, but again, people get tired of the same thing. They want to move on to something else. So in the 70s, this idea called affirmative action was, uh, was begun. So what does this mean? 
uh, daughter of alum, son of big donor, soccer player, raised in distant state, minority didn't get in. It's his fault. It's the minority's fault. So what does that mean? Well, uh, affirmative action was was a big government kind of idea, a liberal idea, to consider the disadvantages of minority groups and women because it had disadvantages for so long. African Americans enslaved, Hispanic Americans kept from taking part in the, of the real estate boom, all these things, whatever it might be. There's a whole list of them. So let's consider the disadvantages and create an advantage for them. So positions were set aside for minorities. So in a big company, if you have 100 jobs that were available, affirmative action would say you need to hire 20 African Americans, you need to hire 20 Hispanics. Uh, I'm kind of giving you an example. I'm not suggesting it was completely like that, but just, just to get an idea of, of what, what they were doing. So, of course, white America is screaming, this is reverse discrimination. Even, even, even yelling at us for discriminating against you for centuries. Now you're discriminating against us because if I'm a white person that has the top score, uh, I'm, the, I'm the, you know, the best qualified for this job, you're saying that I'm going to lose my job to a minority. Okay. Uh, a white person more qualified is passed over just to get a minority in. So people don't like that either, okay? So why affirmative action? Progressive nations follow positive discrimination. It's a democratic process of development with just and equitable growth. The idea was for, to provide employment opportunities to the marginalized. Marginalized means discriminate uh, groups of people for their economic liberalization to, to give them a head start um, you know, if you like to swim every day and you think you're a pretty good swimmer and you just started swimming two months ago and you're happy with your progress, if somebody said, okay, now you got to gotta, uh, race against an Olympic swimmer or you're going to lose your job, you're going to say, well, wait a minute. You know, that, that person had a lifetime of training. I haven't, so it's not fair. Well, that's what they're trying to say. African Americans and Hispanic Americans and Asian Americans, in many cases, women of all colors. They didn't have a lifetime of being prepared for this job. They they went to dilapidated schools. They didn't get the right education. They were kept separate by, by laws. Uh, so let's not throw them in without any kind of, of help. Let's let's level the playing field. So now, now you're gonna race that Olympic swimmer, but you're, you're gonna get, you know, uh, uh, halfway across one length of uh, uh, start. Okay, so that's the idea behind it. I, I think that it came from a good place. I, I think it it was meant well, but it, this this would fall pretty flat and pretty hard, and people fought very hard against it. And a man a man named uh, Jim uh, Allen, sorry, Bucky, uh, a white man sued the University of California Medical School. Uh, he argued that their admissions program was built to give all individuals an equal opportunity while creating a diverse student body. But he argued that his rights had been violated when lower qualified minorities were accepted over him. He declared that this violated the Equal Protection Act and the Civil Rights Act. And he was probably right. Uh, so this kind of comes, un, uh, comes unravels, unravel. California votes it out. And even though there's, there's parts of it that are still around today, for the most part, it, it, it's over. So this was happening in employment and college entrance. So another part of it was college entrance, you know, where minor, minorities that, that were less qualified, according to, to some people, were getting accepted into colleges where more qualified whites weren't. But how, how do you shift the balance if you, don't, if you don't give people that have been marginalized a break like that? How's it ever going to be equal if you don't give them a chance to catch up? That, that's the argument, okay? Uh, okay, the Equal Rights Amendment also um, came back to life in the 1970s. Uh, we talked about this a couple of times, Alice Paul in the 20s and going back even into the 19th century. A call for an Equal Rights Amendment. Equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged 
by the United States or by any state on account of sex. So again, the Constitution doesn't say anywhere that women have the same rights as men. To the, today I'm talking about. Uh, but people, people push back about this. And many people felt that women shouldn't have the same rights as men. They're women. They should be at home. If they have the same rights as men, are you going to draft them and put them in the army? Of course, we, from today's lens, we do that. But this was unheard of in the 70s. Uh, but actually, what how this, how this came undone was mostly women in, in, a, in a huge way. Many women wanted to remain in their traditional roles in the home. On the right, you see Phyllis Schlafly, a huge opponent of ERA, a woman. <clears throat> pushing that we don't want equal rights. Uh, the feminist movement is just not compatible with happiness. They are not for equality. They want to kill everything masculine. <clears throat> She's a huge voice against this. Now, we, we remember uh, uh, Betty Friedan. Uh, she becomes a huge voice for it. And uh, Friedan and Schlafly had some pretty epic... Um, debates and arguments about this, and you can see them on YouTube. Um, so this this narrowly missed becoming an amendment as late as 1982 still has not become an amendment. Still to this day, their, their equal rights for women are not in the Constitution. Another landmark case in the 70s is Roe v. Wade, still a very controversial subject today. Early 1960s, <clears throat> abortion was illegal of any kind. Any kind except by a doctor to save your life. But many women were saying, you know, we, there's unwanted pregnancies and, and we're young, we made a mistake and we don't want to be saddled with a child right now. It should be our choice to make that decision. The government shouldn't tell us that we have to keep this pregnancy if we don't want it, okay? Very controversial subject, still a, a raging controversy today much violence between pro-life and pro-choice people even today. And of course, this brings in, you know, many aspects, I'm talking about uh, lots of things here. Uh, women's rights, uh, were they, did women have rights to privacy? Did women have the rights to make it a choice? Did a person under age, under 18, have to go to her parents and say, I'm pregnant? Or could she go and get an abortion without having, without telling her parents? All these things were, were part of this. But this landmark case uh, was won, and it said that it was legal in the first trimester of a pregnancy for a woman to abort her child. Roe v. Wade made it a choice. Uh, of course, this made the pro-life people come unglued, and it still is a huge uh, issue today. Uh, Donald Trump, although uh, as his administration moves on, he's got more problems than perhaps this. But one of his campaign, spe uh, campaign points was that he would overturn Roe v. Wade. He's a conservative. He, he caters to the conservative, ultra-conservative uh, part of the Republican Party. And if you're ultra-conservative, you probably want abortion to be illegal. Uh, you, sh you shouldn't be allowed to. In their, in their mind, and the life, okay? So you have a conservative backlash to all of these things, okay? And uh, you have the return of evangelism again. So you, re religion uh, kind of rears its head. And I, don't, I, I didn't say ugly head. I just said it, it becomes more popular when, when times are full of strife and arguments and, and arguments about, about morality. Religion becomes popular again. So you have the return of evangelism. Uh, and you have the idea of mixing religion with politics. And politicians take on the moniker of the religious right and, and what was called family values. Okay. Uh, oops, sorry. There we go. Uh, so politicians trying to... Uh, Reach your emotions by saying we're going to return America back to the good old days when it's about family and and these types of things. So don't misunderstand me. I, I, I have a family and I love my family and I'm all about my family. I'm not suggesting that, that 
This is a bad thing. I'm all I'm you know, family values are great. Politicians shouldn't be pushing family values. Politicians shouldn't be pushing religious points of view because the, the Constitution says that we need to separate uh, church and state. Uh, we came to the New World to escape religious persecution in Europe, where you were forced to follow state religion or you might lose your life. So freedom of religion gave people the right to follow whatever religion they wanted to or not. You could be an atheist, too. That's okay. But one of the ways to, to keep it free is to not have the state take on a religion or a credo like Europe, like Europe did. So the separation of church and state is a valued part of the Constitution, yet you have these politicians today. And it doesn't really matter what party you are. Most politicians will always say, God bless America at the end. That's a night, and I'm not suggesting that's a bad thing, but but it really is not supposed to be there. You're, you're supposed to have the freedom to to uh, worship and follow your faith the way you want, as long as you don't break the law with your people. You can be as loud as you want to be about it. You can run around and 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 try to get people to come to your church. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, the the Constitution condones it, right? It's okay to to uh, uh, publicly demonstrate about whatever you want, uh, but it, it's not, it's not supposed to be immersed into our politics. So you know, people argue about why do, why is our money saying God we trust? Not everyone in this country believes in God, and while the Christian religion is with, without question that the majority in the country, there's many people who are atheists, many people who are Buddhists and have different points of view, uh, Hindus, whatever it might be. Okay, so. That, that's the idea, but this this family values thing really comes to to the to the top here in the 70s. It's a backlash to all these equal rights and Roe v. Wade and all these things. You have this you have this reaction, uh, but again, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So. You can't prohibit it, but you can't establish it either in the state. That's the argument. Uh, so a a candidate, a vice president, 1992. So I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but but Dan Quayle is the candidate that a uh, vice president uh, of George Bush uh, Senior, and he kind of becomes the family values uh, uh, candidate. So 1992. He delivers a family values speech. So understand, this is a handsome man, young guy in those days. <laughs> the Republican Party thought, we've got our Jack Kennedy. This is going to be our guy. We're going to groom him. He'll be George Bush Sr.'s vice president for eight years. Then he will go on to, in, in his own eight years, we're going to have this dominant Republican period. And it, 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 it made sense. He was a very popular man. He was good looking. People like that. Uh, but then he kind of takes it too far and he completely comes undone. Uh, so 1992, Vice President Dan Quayle delivered a family values speech where he chided the popular TV show at that time called Murphy Brown. So on the right there, you see Candace Bergen, an actress. She played the character Murphy Brown, uh, a 40-something woman divorced news anchor on TV, an anchor on a, on a news show. Uh, so Dan Quayle chides the character. Murphy Brown's not a real person. It was the character in the show. But, but on the show, she's a single mother raising a kid without a husband. And Dan Quayle criticizes the character for her decision to have a child outside of marriage. Okay. And this is part of his his uh, speech. Bearing babies irresponsibly is simply wrong. Failing to support children when his father is wrong. We must be unequivocal about this. It doesn't help matters when primetime TV has Murphy Brown, a character who supposedly epitomizes today's intelligent, highly paid professional woman, mocking the importance of fathers by bearing a child alone and calling it just another lifestyle choice. This is 1992, not that far back. You know, w women had gained much independence than, th than they had had. 
And many women came undone at this and reacting in a huge way. Who are you to tell us what we should be doing? If I want to have a child on my own and raise my, my child as a single mother, I can certainly do that. And many, many women in that era made that, in this era too, make, make that choice. It's a choice that you have. It's a choice. You can do what you want in a free, a free country. But here's the president saying that it's immoral. And, and that it's wrong and, and mocking it. So uh, the women's movement uh, comes undone and, and becomes very, very anti-Quail. Uh, so Quail's argument that Brown was sending the wrong message, that single parenthood should not be encouraged, erupted into a major, major campaign controversy. Uh, George Bush Sr. would, would not be reelected to a second term. Uh, now, I, I'm not suggesting that this is the only reason, but Dan Quayle didn't help him any, guarantee you that. Uh, so, Dan, we're going to talk more about Dan Quayle um, in the next chapter with some of his missteps. But just for fun, I want you to watch one quick film here. It's only a minute long. Uh, and so please watch the film You're No Jack Kennedy. So here on, on this in this speech, Quayle starts to compare himself to John Kennedy. Uh, in fact, that he might even have more, uh, you know, uh, experience where he was at that time than John Kennedy had when John Kennedy entered the presidency. You, you've got to understand, John Kennedy was assassinated, and that that made him, you know, hallowed ground. So you don't typically want to criticize or question someone like that. But Quayle does it here, and the man that he's talking to, the man he's debating with, has a response that was pretty famous. So please watch the the film. You're no Jack Kennedy. Okay, so like I said, we'll we'll talk more about Quayle next chapter. But I do want to show you these things just to, to kind of give you the the idea of how this hugely popular man, Quayle, that came in with all this promising future, just just disintegrated pretty quickly, mostly on, because of his own accord. Uh, very very famously goes to uh, goes to a school like like politicians do. It's a camera moment, and, and there's the vice president and his wife, and they're sitting in the classroom with the kids watching them. And so on, and it's, it, it's it's great PR. So in this one case, uh, he was in the school, and they were having a spelling contest, and the the uh, the word was potato, and the little boy got up and spelled potato correctly, P O T A T O. But Quail on national live TV said, "Oh, excuse me, son. Now wait a minute. You spelled it wrong. You got to put an e at the end." And of course, the teachers are saying, uh, "Mr. Vice President, like they don't want to embarrass the poor guy." And he walks up and puts an E in the in the in this the students like shocked, like, "What do I do?" And then finally, someone said, uh, uh, "Mr. Vice President, there's no E at the end of the day." <laughs> I mean, not not the not the worst mistake in the world, right? But I mean, this is a man that had already made some missteps. Murphy Brown. Now he's misspelling potato. And next class, we'll see that how far this even even goes further. He's an interesting man in American history. Okay, so conservative politicians use family values and the return to religion as a vehicle to get votes. Is this right? Do you feel that this is right? That that they're playing on your emotion, and your faith to get votes? Are they are they being truthful to you when they say that we will honor your beliefs? Do, do they deliver in the end? Uh, the Republican Party today has become the party of family values. And back in Quayle's time a little bit before, even it, you could say it starts with Ronald Reagan, uh, the, the return to, uh, to, to evangelicism starts with in the A's with Ronald Reagan. You have the start of the religious or Christian right. And of course, I, I said that it's a it's a rebirth of conservatism, and this is part of it. Okay, okay, that is the end of chapter twenty nine. Uh, thank you.